Hi, welcome to my set of video lectures for engineering mechanics. I'm Dane Quinn from the University of Akron, and today I would like to discuss modeling connected objects. So the idea is that we have multiple masses in the system that are in some sense connected, right? In this case, we'll be connecting them by cables. So let's look at the problem. I've got a disk, uh, mass M2, radius R, and a block of mass M1 is suspended by a cable on the left that's wrapped around the outside of that disk. Now, that disk is pinned to the ground, and it has a spring on the other side, and an internal hub, right? So you can think about this as like a spool, and the radius here is half the overall radius, and a damper is connected with a cable to that internal hub. I'd like to determine the equations of motion for this system and determine, obviously, the natural frequency and damping ratio for the overall equations of motion. So when we start these problems, we, we like to stop and think about what's going to happen for a moment. So here, the disk rotates. And the block translates up and down. So that's the general motion, and what we see is that this cable, which is an extensible, connects the two. And as a result, the motion of the block is tied to the rotation of the disk. So really, this is a single degree of freedom system. We only need one coordinate to describe the configuration of the system. Of course, we're going to define multiple coordinates which will then introduce a number of constraint equations. But again, we only need one, and ultimately we'll come up with one second order constant coefficient differential equation of motion. Now, the other side of this is that the spring and the damper undergo different displacements. Right? So we have displacements for the spring and the damper that we'll also need to calculate. And then, obviously, relate to the motion of the block and the disk. So uh, that's kind of a description of, of what's going to happen. This disk is going to rotate, and then the block will move up and down. This spring will stretch, and we'll have velocity across this damper, which will then produce a force. Here, we also have gravity in the system. And so if I look at the forces, right, the forces arise from gravity, right, this gravitational load. Uh, we'll have an internal force or a tension in the cable that we'll have to account for on the block. And we'll have spring forces, well, just one spring force, and a force due to the damper. acting on this inner hub, and finally, we'll have a reaction force at the pin, right? something to hold this disk in place. Let's go and identify those forces on our so-called force diagram. So let's start off with gravity. Uh, we have the gravitational load on, on the block, so we'll call that WB for the weight of the block. There's a gravitational load on the disk, right? so that'll be WD, the weight of the disk. Uh, the next thing we have is the tension. Now, again, this is kind of what I want to highlight in this problem. If you look at this tension, you can think about cutting this cable here and replacing that by two forces. Right? So one force acts on, say, the lower half and acting on the block. Right? So that's going to be T. Right? Again, we're just defining this defining these forces, uh, getting down in our, our mind that they're there. The other side of this acts on the disk over on the left, right? So that force we'll call minus T. Now, we have to be careful that we make sure these forces balance out, right? Because they're internal forces. We cut this cable, right? So whatever force acts on one side, the opposite force has to act on the other side. That's why these forces are both called T, Right? But this one's plus t, right? so it's a little plus there, and this one's minus t. So the net force from these two is zero. Again, it's internal. Now, 
I'll be honest, I don't actually know that this force is up. This force could potentially at this point be directed down, right? But that's okay, because if it's directed down, then this force, since it's minus t, would actually be directed up, and it would still balance out. Right, so again, I don't have to know anything at all about this force, but what I am indicating here is that they have essentially equal magnitude and opposite direction. Now, we have a spring force, right, so that'll be acting over here on the right, and we'll say this is Fs. We have a damping force, right, so that'll be acting on that inner hub there, Fd. Finally, we have a reaction force. Again, I don't know anything at all about this reaction force. So I'm just going to put some sort of general force acting in some arbitrary direction. And we'll call that R. Looking at this problem, you know, I, I think I've got everything now. Right? I've accounted for all the forces. There, there are no other forces that act on this system. Because um, we've got the spring and the damper, the reaction, the weight, and the, the tension. Um, and we've, we've sort of recognized that they're here. So we're in a good place to start, right? We've thought about the problem a little bit, and now let's go and define and identify coordinates and directions. We'll start off with directions. Um, here, really, everything is in the i and the j direction. Right? So we'll just go and define i as horizontal and j as vertical uh, in the direction of gravity. All the forces are in either the i and the j direction. This reaction force will break up into components in the i and j direction. Um, all of the motion is in the i and j direction. In particular, the block moves in the j direction, and the disk doesn't move. Of course, we have rotation, which we assume is in the k direction, right, out of the board. Now, let's go and think about uh, coordinates. Okay, so let's look at the motion first. For this disk, we want to identify the rotation, right? I mean, the disk rotates, so we need an angle, right? So we'll say this angle theta, which is counterclockwise, or as it rotates in the k direction, measures the angle of rotation of the disk. Then for the block, uh, let's identify a point B here, and we'll identify the displacement of the block in the j direction as x. Now, you may look at this and go, well, that's wrong, right? Because if this disk rotates, say, counterclockwise, so that theta is positive, shouldn't this block move down? And, and my answer is yes, it, it, it will. We'll see that when we identify different constraint equations for, for the system. Right now, I just want to focus on the disk. Right? So we'll define a coordinate for the disk. And then, completely independently and separately, I'm going to focus on the block. Maybe I want to define x as the displacement of the block. I'll relate these two coordinates later, right? But at this point, I just want to be able to describe the motion of all the individual pieces in whatever way I think is appropriate, right? So here, honestly, I'm, I'm kind of doing this on purpose to highlight the fact that you don't need to be able to relate these coordinates right now. We'll do that later. So we started off with the motion, defining coordinates and directions for that. So once again, rotation of the disk and translation of the block. We also use coordinates for forces. Here, the forces that we'll need to relate to the configuration are the spring and the force in the damper. So, looking at the spring, all right, let's put a point here. We'll say that's A, and we'll measure the stretch in the spring uh, with Z. Let's do the same for the damper. Right, so here, y will describe the displacement across the damping element. And we'll identify this point as c. Finally, we'll identify the center of the disk as, as g. So in 
terms of the coordinates that we need, right? We have coordinates that will describe the motion of the disk and the motion of the block. And then we have coordinates that will help us determine the force in the spring and the force in the damper. So again, these forces, they'll be related by constraint equations. So when we do that, we do need some sense of, of an origin for these forces. And here I will assume that each coordinate vanishes in a common configuration. So their origin all is measured from a single configuration. Right? So if x is equal to 0, theta is equal to 0, and y is equal to 0, and z is equal to 0. Then if we have sort of gotten the directions wrong, we'll end up finding that out in the constraint equations. So now let's look at the kinematics. Let's actually go and figure out right, what's the motion, how do we relate these coordinates. Well, for the block, the acceleration of the block, is naturally written in terms of x as x double dot in the j direction. And then for the disk, well, the acceleration of the center of the disk is equal to zero, while the angular acceleration of the disk is theta double dot in the k direction. Now, if I want to look at constraints, Let's try to relate everything back to the rotation, right? Turns out that'll be a natural way of doing it. So let's look at, for example, the velocity of A. Well, the velocity of every point on this section of the cable is the same, right? So in particular, the velocity of A is the same as the velocity of this point where the cable connects to the disk. So from there, written on the disk, we see that the velocity of A is the velocity of G plus the angular velocity of the disk cross the position of A with respect to G. And really what we find is that the velocity of A is Z dot in the J direction. The velocity of G is zero. For the disk, we have theta dot in the K direction as the angular velocity, and then the position of this point on the right with respect to the center is r in the i direction. So k cross i is equal to j, and we find that z dot is r times theta dot. OK, let's look at, say, b. Well, the velocity of b, same kind of calculation, the velocity of g plus the angular velocity of the disk cross r of now b with respect to g. And we can go through and work all of this out. Maybe if you want to pause the video right now and, and go through this cross product and these calculations, ultimately what you'll find is that x dot is equal to minus r theta dot. Right? And I should put up here, this was in the j direction. But then when we take the component in the j direction, we find that z dot is r theta dot. Likewise, for the velocity of b, x dot will be minus r theta dot. And finally, for c, the velocity of c is the velocity of g plus the angular velocity of the disk cross the position of c with respect to g. And again, this point a that I'm considering is actually where this part of the cable connects with the disk. This point b is where this part of the cable, and these all have the same velocity, connects with the disk. And finally, this point is where this part of the cable connects with that inner hub. And so when we work through this, we find that y dot is r theta dot divided by two. So we're able to use these to relate z and theta, and then x and theta, and y and theta. And, and of course, I could choose to write any three of these in terms of any other. 
So we've gotten the kinematics down, right? The acceleration is x double dot in the j direction. The angular acceleration is theta double dot k. And we have our constraint equations. Now, let's go and use these coordinates that we just defined to identify what these forces are. Well, we had force due to the weight. So here, let's go in and define those weights, identify them. This is minus m1g in the j direction. Uh, the weight of the disk, minus m2g in the j direction. Let's do the reaction force next. I, I don't know anything at all about this, so I'll just break this up into components in the i and the j direction. Now let's look at the spring force. Well, if z is the stretch in the spring, then this force becomes minus k times z in the j direction. So if z is positive, this force is in the minus j direction. Looking at the damper, if y dot is positive, so that this point C moves to the left, then the resulting force acting on the disk is to the right. So that's B times Y dot in the I direction. Finally, looking at this tension, I'll remind you that the tensions acting on these two objects must cancel. because it's an internal force. So they have to have, again, equal magnitude and opposite direction. So if we call this one T in the J direction, then this force has to be minus T in the J direction. So that again, when we add these two together, they cancel out as an internal force. We have the kinematics. We have the forces that we've identified. Now, it's time to go apply the equations of motion. Right? So we will apply momentum balance to each object. And remember, momentum balance is linear momentum balance and angular momentum balance. Let's look at, say, the block first. Right? The block doesn't rotate, so there really the, the equation for angular momentum balance becomes 0 equals 0. We'll, we'll sort of not worry about that for a moment. And we're just left with linear momentum balance. So some of the forces acting on the block is the mass of the block, which was m1, times the acceleration of the block, b. Here, the only forces are t in the j direction and minus m1 times g, the weight, also in the j direction. And that equals m1 times the acceleration, which we said was x double dot in the j direction. Okay, what about the disk? Well, we have linear momentum balance. Some of the forces equals mass, now the disk is m2, times the acceleration of the mass center. That was actually equal to zero. So, adding up all these forces, right, we have Rx, and, and I'll go ahead and do everything in the i direction together. Right, so we have in the i direction Rx, and then plus b times y dot in the i direction. Then in the j direction, we have Ry, we have minus t, we have minus m2g, and then we have minus k times z, again, all in the j direction. And this is equal to m2 times, well, 0, because the mass center doesn't move. Finally, we have angular momentum balance on the disk. Right? So that's the sum of the moments about the center of mass is the moment of inertia about the center of mass times the angular acceleration of the disk. Okay. Let's go and calculate that. Well, when I look at this disk, the reaction force produces no moments. The weight does not produce a moment. But there is a moment produced by the tension and the spring force and the damping force. Right, so I'm going to go ahead and write all this out. Uh, if you want to pause this, then you can verify that the moment from the tension is T 
times r. And, and I will remind you, in, in case you're doing this on your own, that a moment is equal to r cross f, right? So it's a position vector cross the force. So the moment from the tension is t times r in the k direction. The moment from the spring force is minus k times z times r. And then the moment from the damping force is minus b times y dot r over 2. All of these in the k direction. And this equals the moment of inertia of the disk, which is m2 r squared over 2 times theta double dot in the k direction. OK, so now we need to simplify this. Well, it turns out this is not as bad as it looks. We have one equation here. We actually have two equations here, one in the i direction, one in the, k in the j direction. And then we have a fourth equation here. But I'm going to point out that this reaction force, which is unknown, so we'll do that in red, only appears in this component in the i direction. Likewise, this reaction force in the y direction only appears in this equation in the j direction. Right? So essentially, these two equations decouple, right? because I could go and solve these two for the motion and then finally put them back in and solve for these reaction forces. But we don't need them to reduce these two equations for the block and the disk. OK, let's do that. So we can reduce this equation, which is linear momentum balance on the block, and this equation, which comes from angular momentum balance on the disk. And again, linear momentum balance on the disk would allow me to solve for these reaction forces. right? But again, these two highlighted equations can be reduced. In particular, I will solve this equation for t. Right, so here we find that t is equal to m1x double dot plus m1 times g. And I will use that then down here in this second equation. Right, so I get m1x double dot plus m1 times g right, times r minus kzr minus b times y dot r over 2 is m2r squared divided by 2 theta double dot. Right, so I, let me just reorganize this a little bit. I'm going to put all the acceleration terms together. So in particular, that's m1r x double dot. And then this term I'm going to put over on the left-hand side, m2r squared over 2, theta double dot. I'll put the damping term next, minus b y dot r over 2. Uh, the stiffness term will follow that, minus k r, or k times z times r. And then this constant term I will move over to the right-hand side. Right, so minus m1 g r. So here we have a single equation in terms of the various coordinates. Well, here it is again. And I remember that I have constraint equations that relate the coordinates. These were developed in our kinematics section. So what I can do is basically choose one coordinate and write this first equation as a single degree of freedom equation in terms of a single coordinate only. So let's choose x. Let's, let's write this equation in terms of the displacement of the block. So here, what we find when we do this algebra is m1 plus m2 over 2 x double dot plus b over 4 times x dot and then plus k times x equals minus m1g. Right, so again, there's a little bit of algebra. I solved some stuff. Um, for example, I solved theta from here, substituted it into there. 
I w was able to write for Y and Z in terms of X. Um, end up eliminating an R from all of this. And this is the equation of motion that we get. As with all single degree of freedom, constant coefficient, linear differential equations, we can identify equivalent parameters. So here, the equivalent mass is in front of the x double dot term. So the equivalent mass is m1 plus m2 divided by 2. And likewise, the equivalent damping is b over 4. Finally, the equivalent stiffness, well, that's just k, right? Because k sits in front of the x term. Now, I asked for the natural frequency and the damping ratio. Okay, great. Omega n is the square root of k equivalent divided by m equivalent. So we have these various equivalent parameters, and what we find, do a little bit of algebra, and this we can write as 2k divided by 2m1 plus m2. The damping ratio is b equivalent divided by 2 square root of k m both equivalent values and once again let's take these substitute in just a slight bit of algebra gives me b divided by 4 times the square root of 2k times 2 m1 plus m2 we said did just a little bit of algebra to, to simplify this relationship. So here are the, uh, basically the natural frequency and damping ratio for this system written in terms of the various system parameters. So I'd like to do a little more, right? I'd actually like to investigate the idea of this internal tension and what it means under various choices for the coordinates. So here, the static displacement of the block can be easily solved from the equation of motion, right? Because it's not moving, right? So x dot is equal to 0. x double dot is equal to 0 for the static displacement, right? So again, this is a constant solution to this equation of motion. And that constant solution ends up solving k times x equilibrium is minus m1 g. Basically, I'll put x equilibrium into this equation. And of course, again, x dot is equal to 0, x double dot is equal to 0. So we're just left with this piece over here. Or solving for that x equilibrium is minus m1 times g divided by k. So something I want to point out here is that the dynamic response, right, so the motion, depends on all the system parameters. And in particular, the dynamic response depends on m2, right, the mass of the disk. But the static displacement, which is what we just calculated, is independent of m2. It doesn't necessarily occur that all of these system parameters influence all the different features of, 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 the, of the response. So if you were just to blindly look at this system and say, oh, well, the total mass is m1 plus m2, and I have a spring over here, and I, I know that, the, that weight divided by stiffness is, is displacement, you might say that m1 plus m2 times g divided by k is, is some static displacement, but it's not in this case. Right? The static displacement is given here. And we get this by solving the equations of motion. 
So everything that we calculate in these problems should come from the models that we developed, not our intuition or, or, or you know, what we kind of think were, is going to happen. Right? Everything that we calculate should follow from, from the equations and the modeling that we've done. So let's now look at, at again, this idea of the tension in the system. So here I have the equation of motion that we developed, and I've also listed the static equilibrium position. So we've seen before, if we measure from static equilibrium, right, nice things happen. And the equations of motion simplify. So what do we mean by that? Well, let u of t be equal to x of t minus x equilibrium. For this transformation, x dot is equal to u dot. And x double dot is equal to u double dot. Right. So this is the original velocity in terms of x. And that's equal to the derivative of u, and likewise for the second derivative. So making these transformations and substitutions back into the equation of motion, we find that in terms of u, the equation of motion looks like m1 plus m2 divided by 2, u double dot, and then plus b over 4 times u dot plus k times u is equal to 0. So, again, we saw this in a previous lecture, but measuring from static equilibrium is equivalent to neglecting gravity. If we were just to model this system without gravity, this is the equation of motion we would come up with. So again, this is equivalent to neglecting gravity in the system. What does that mean for things like the tension, though? Well, so over here, let's imagine that we were measuring from static equilibrium, or actually, let's imagine that we were neglecting gravity. Then on this block, we just have a single force. We'll call that T star in the J direction. Right? And so here, we'll say this is point B star. So these star values are all the corresponding values when we neglect gravity. In contrast, with G, we have, well, we've already seen this is T in the J direction. This force was minus M2 times G in the J direction. And for the coordinates, we measured the displacement of the block with the coordinate x. Here this would be b. For this system, we'll actually measure the displacement as u. Right? Because, again, we're just going to measure the displacement with u. And these two coordinates, x and u, are related by this relationship. So we see that the displacement of the block is the static equilibrium displacement, which was minus m1g over k plus u. So if for the system, if the motion's the same, Right? This is how u and x are related. But again, if we were to neglect gravity, right, we would just have a, an, a tension, which we'll call t star, and a coordinate u. If we include gravity, we have a tension t and a displacement x. Let's go and look and see how those resulting equations are related. Well, for the system where we neglect gravity, there's only the tension t star in the j direction, which equals m1 u double dot in the j direction. So 
this tension is M1 U double dot. For the system with gravity, T minus M2 G in the J direction is equal to M1 X double dot in the J direction. So T is equal to M1 X double dot plus M2 times G. If we, again, if we neglect gravity, we have this sort of pink system. If we include gravity, then we have this red system. And how are those related? Well, here they are again, and what we find is that because u double dot is equal to x double dot, this term, m1 x double dot, is equal to m1 u double dot, which actually is t star. So as a result, we find that the tension in the original system is equal to the weight of the block plus this tension that we would have identified in the absence of gravity. So I, I want to show those two sort of pictorially. And I'll remind you here that when we go and solve this equation, we would find that u of t is some amplitude e to the minus sigma t sine omega d t plus a phase shift. So this is the kind of solution that we would find. u and theta are arbitrary constants that would need to be chosen to satisfy initial conditions. And we can always take a second derivative of this, and we get the following. u e to the minus sigma t times... Well, it turns out it's sigma minus omega d squared. I did this ahead of time, and I'm just writing out what I found when I took two derivatives of u. You can pause this and, and work out the derivatives now, if you'd like. But we get minus 2 sigma omega d times cosine omega d times t plus theta. Again, sigma is the decay rate. Omega d is the nat uh, damp natural frequency. So let me, let me plot these two functions. I'll start off with, with t star. t star is just m1 times u double dot, right? So this just decays exponentially and oscillates with frequency omega d, right? So maybe we get this kind of picture here. And, of course, <laughs> here it oscillates about the origin. The reason I point this out is that this t star value is positive and negative as the system decays. And you might look at this and go, well, how can cables support negative tension, which actually would be compression? And my answer is, well, they can't, right? We know how strings work, right? If you take a string and you try to compress it, right, it just sort of folds up. We can't have a compressive force applied to a cable. However, in the case of the system with gravity, then that T star value is actually shifted up by the weight of the cable. So now here, we have an offset for the physical tension by exactly the weight of the block. So when we're neglecting gravity, we might have a negative value of T star. But in the actual physical system, because of this offset due to the weight of the block, that tension always remains positive. And as a result, that cable would never slacken. So when the system is measured from static equilibrium, which implies that we can neglect constant forcing, such as due to the weight of the object, the internal variables well, they actually describe the response relative to those static equilibrium values, right? So the static value of the tension is just M1G, and then the dynamic value of the tension is indicated here. But if we were to assume at the beginning that we measured from static equilibrium, and so we neglected the gravitational load, then the tension that we would measure actually represents relative to static equilibrium. So a lot of times these sort of non-physical results like compressive strings 
are okay in our modeling, right? Because again, they are now relative to some constant offset provided by the weight of the block. So again, these, these, these connected objects often have internal forces and we need to make sure that when we model these systems, in particular, these connected objects and the internal forces are defined appropriately. So if on one side we have plus t in the j direction, then on the other side we have minus t in the j direction. So that, again, these balance out when we look at the overall system. So that's it for, for this lecture. Uh, as always, thanks for joining along. If you have any questions, please reach out. Um, you, can, you can contact me by email, uh, probably the best way. Uh, if you're taking this for a course, uh, obviously we have, we have ways of contacting me there as well. Uh, please leave comments. Always looking for feedback. Thanks so much, and I will talk to you again. Bye.